When countries around the world ratified the Paris Climate Agreement in 2016, they pledged to prevent average global temperatures from rising to a level more than 2 degrees Celsius, or 3.7 degrees Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial levels. They picked that number because 2 degrees Celsius is the point at which climate models start going haywire. But they also asked the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, to review all of the available research and tell us what we'd have to do to keep that rise even deeper below 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the point at which feedback loops like melting tundras and increased water vapor make the two degree increase all but inevitable. Scientists from around the world spent the last two years reviewing over 6,000 scientific papers mapping out different pathways to the 1.5 degree target, from paths that focus primarily on reducing energy demand to those that focus primarily on expanding carbon sinks that pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. One of those carbon sinks is the one that I cover on Bionic Planet, namely natural climate solutions that work by improving the way we manage our forests, farms, and fields. The other is next-generation carbon capture and storage, involving new technologies that either don't yet exist or exist but cost a fortune to deploy. On Monday, the IPCC released its report, and the upshot is that we can meet the 1.5-degree target by deploying a blend of these strategies, but it basically requires us to overhaul the industrial and agricultural economies. Simple, right? Actually, a lot of it is simple, but it's not easy to implement because our economy puts more value on fast cars and cheap beef than on clean air or a stable climate. But the report does identify a mechanism for getting beyond that, and it's a mechanism we've covered before, namely making companies pay for the damages that their greenhouse gases cause, or, as we say colloquially, putting a price on carbon. But how much damage does a ton of carbon dioxide cause? And can we put a number on it? These are the questions an economist named William Nordhaus has spent his life addressing, through economic modeling, first on a desktop computer, and then with more and more sophistication. On Monday, within hours of the IPCC issuing its report, the Royal Bank of Sweden announced that it was awarding the Nobel Prize for Economics to Nordhaus and another economist, Paul Romer, who focused on the economics of investing in education and in our collective future. To honor Nordhaus, I'm reposting parts of two early episodes featuring environmental economist Gernot Wagner, who documented Nordhaus's quest to quantify the social cost of carbon in his 2015 book, Climate Shock. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, And we know it's ugly face, we should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth. We broke it, we own it. And nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields. And not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? Technology? Geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet 
or is nature itself the answer? That's the question we address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we revisit our 2016 interview with environmental economist Gernot Wagner, who today co-directs Harvard University's Solar Geoengineering Research Program, which means we'll probably be catching up to him again soon. But before we get to today's chat, let's meet a few other people. There is a case for doing something about pollution, but the way we've been going about it is the wrong way. Is there a case for the government to do something yes, about it? Yes, there is a case for the government to do something about it, because there's always a case for the government, to some extent, when what two people do affects a third party. If you are an American of a certain age, you probably recognize these voices. One is Nobel laureate Milton Friedman, considered by many to be the patron saint of free market economics. The other is Phil Donahue, a fairly liberal talk show host who, like Oprah Winfrey after him, hosted a popular daytime show from Chicago. But Donahue's heyday came in the 1970s and 80s, and this exchange took place way back in 1970, when Donahue was still doing his show from Dayton, Ohio. Someone at the University of Chicago dug up some clips a few years back for a panel discussion that the university called What Would Milton Friedman Do About Climate Change? We'll hear excerpts from that panel discussion in a bit, but first I want to take you back to the Paris climate talks at the end of 2015, where world leaders who never seemed to agree on anything agreed on one thing. We need to put a clear price on carbon to signal to industry, uh, to producers, to uh, consumers where we are going as a society and reward people who are making smarter decisions about including externalities. That's Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau using a word that you're going to hear a lot today, externalities. If you don't know what it means, I guarantee you will know by the end of today's show. Here's Michelle Bachelet, who was president of Chile during the climate talks. Environmental externalities cannot continue to be ignored by our countries. Cheap and dirty energy is not cheap for the planet or the health of our people. Have you figured it out yet? For now, just think of externalities as what we create when we dump our garbage on someone else's lawn, or that a smoker creates when he exhales into our faces, or when a neighbor with bad taste plays his music too loud. Even a free market enthusiast like Milton Friedman agreed that markets alone can't handle externalities, at least not without some help. There's always a case for the government, to some extent, when what two people do affects a third party. So there's more of a case, for example, for uh, emission control than there is for airbags. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what's the best way to do it? And the best way to do it is not to have bureaucrats in Washington write rules and regulations saying that a car has to carry this, that, or the other. The best way to do it is to impose a tax on the amount of pollutants emitted by a car and make it in the self-interest of of the car manufacturers and of the consumers to keep down the amount of pollution in that way. That's what William Nordhaus says, too. And it's what most economists say as well. It's also what world leaders say. Here's Bachelet again. When green taxes are incorporated into our climate policies, we can harness market forces that can lead to profound changes in our emission patterns. Indeed, carbon pricing combined with smart energy reform can be instrumental in unleashing clean technology and building the foundations for a low-carbon economy. If you go back to episode one of Bionic Planet, you'll hear more world leaders endorse a price on carbon, including Ethiopia's then Prime Minister Haile Mariam de Seligen, France's then President François Hollande, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel, as well as Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto. And a price on carbon is popular here in the United States as well, and not just among Democrats. Even prominent Republicans like former Bush administration officials James Baker and Hank Paulson advocate a carbon tax. Why is this such a popular idea? 
I reached Gernot Wagner to find out. A quick word on the audio quality. I reached him via Skype while he was visiting family in Austria. And this was before I learned the tricks for doing those calls right, and I was also using the wrong microphone for myself. So the sound quality is a little bit sketchy, but I think you'll find the subject fascinating. He takes us pretty deep into the weeds, but in a way that I think is fairly easy to follow. Early on, we'll segue into that panel discussion I mentioned earlier. Then we'll get into the rationale for carbon pricing, and we'll explore the differences between cap and trade and a carbon tax. Your core argument is that we should be paying at least $40 per ton of carbon dioxide emitted, but the problem is instead we're subsidizing emissions to the tune of about $15 a ton. So we're basically $55 off. That's your, your core. Pretty uh, much, yes. To be fair, right? So the $15 is global. Right. So this is right half a trillion dollars worth of fossil fuel subsidies globally. Now, they're concentrated, right? So obviously it's, you know, right, the Saudis and Venezuela and Iran, right, are subsidizing fossil fuels more than the U.S. and the U- and the Europeans are. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no subsidies in the U.S. and Europe, mm-hmm. right? But most of them are, in fact, concentrated in oil-rich, oil-exporting countries, right? Now, that said, right, if you average out the half a trillion by how, how many tons we um, emit every year globally, it comes out to about $15 per ton of CO2 going the wrong direction. It is a negative externality. There's that word I warned you about at the beginning, externality. And I'd like to break away for a moment to offer a deeper dive into what that means. I'm going to play some audio from that panel discussion I mentioned earlier, the one at the University of Chicago. If you Google Ghost of Milton Friedman materializes in Chicago, you'll find my summary of that discussion, and it's worth listening to. Here's just an excerpt. The first person you'll hear is Steve Sikala, who is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. Then you'll hear Bob Inglis, who was a Republican congressman for the U.S. state of South Carolina, but he lost because he believed in climate science. The third person is Michael Greenstone, who is the U of C's Milton Friedman Professor of Economics. The simple explanation is that an externality is when the exchange between two parties has an effect on a third party who's not participating. Right? So, My students in my class who just spent three hours with me lecturing about externalities are like, why didn't you just say that? It's really simple. (laughs) Um, But you start with the logic for, you know, what are the benefits of markets? Say say I'm selling steel and and, and you're buying it and I sell it to you for for 100 bucks. What, What does that mean, right? That I'm selling steel and he's buying it for 100 bucks. That exchange means that it cost me less or up to $100 to produce that steel. Right? And he, that steel is worth at least $100 to him because he always has the option to walk away. Okay? If he were made better off by having $100 in his pocket, we wouldn't engage in this exchange. Okay? So there's some mutual benefit of exchange that occurs when people unre, you know, unregulated in, in some market exchange these things. We're allocating resources to the people who value them most. Okay. So Anytime someone advocates for a tax or a regulation and, and people say, you know, hold on, there are losses associated with it, what they're talking about is to what extent does that tax or regulation interfere with this exchange that, that we've just negotiated between the two of us, right? Okay, what's missing in that logic is when there's an effect on a, a third party who's not participating in this exchange, okay? So say for this $100 ton of steel that I'm selling, I inflict damages on Michael through my pollution. Right? I've got to you know, burn coal, and you know, he has asthma. Okay? So for every ton of steel, it costs him $20 in health. When I sell steel for $100 a ton, I'm not compensating Michael for the damage that I do. I compensate every one of my other input suppliers. I have to buy the coal. I have to buy the steel. All of that exchange is based on mutually beneficial willing exchange. Okay? But there's no market for the pollution that I'm inflicting on Michael. What does it mean that I'm doing $20 of damage to him? It means that if there were a market, and I said, hey, I, you know, I, I'd like to make this steal, how does 10 bucks sound? You'd say, I'd rather n- not have the pollution because 10 bucks doesn't make it worth my while. Okay? If I said, you know, well, how about 25? It says, pollute away. Right? There's been a mutually beneficial exchange 
between the two of us because I'm compensating him for his pollution. And you used a term one time when we were talking when I was here at the IOP. It was pretty strong. You said yeah. it's really theft. It is theft, okay? That, that's a loaded term, but if someone has a better way of describing and taking something from someone without their consent and without compensating them, I'd be happy to use that term, right? But you can't, you know, go before the judge and say, Your Honor, I didn't steal it. I just took it without compensating them or without their consent, <laughs> yes. right? And that's exactly what it is. When I sell you something for $100 where I didn't pay for all of my inputs, you're, you're not paying for the full cost of what you did. Yeah, so Michael, um, Governor Perry was in uh, New Hampshire last go-round, and he said uh, that we can't price carbon dioxide, essentially. I'm not quoting him exactly, but he said we can't price carbon dioxide because to do so would raise energy rates. Um, so tell me if I said the right thing in USA Today when I responded to that. Um, but tell me what you would say to him. He, he said, he made the point, which is a, a, a tr correct yeah. point, right? That if you, if you stop this theft and make it so that Steve has to put the cost in his steel, the price for me goes up or if we apply that to energy, the price of energy goes up, right? That's just an inexorable fact. Yeah, so let's just pick up on Steve's example uh, and apply it to climate change. What's happening when we turn on the lights uh, and we run a, in the background, run a coal plant or when we drive our car is that carbon dioxide is being emitted into the air. And that is sprinkle, sprinkling around damages in Bangladesh, in Los Angeles, in Houston, even in Austin where uh, Governor Perry works. Yeah. Uh, and those costs are real, and they're, uh, and they're not being reflected in the price that I pay when I fill my gas tank or turn on the light. Uh, and so, actually, I think I would welcome Governor Perry to come here today, and we could talk about it. But the main point is those costs are real, and they're occurring. And if he or the electricity company were to take account of them, it is true that energy prices would be higher. Right. But there would no longer be these innocent parties who are minding their own business and having the climate change around them. And there you have it. That to me is the single simplest explanation of what an externality is. Now, back to Gernot. Uh, it's a negative externality. It ought to have a positive price. Um, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is literally the one law we have in economics, right? So economists, we'd like to be like, you know, we like to be like physicists. Oftentimes we are just not, right? So humans just don't behave like atoms in a vacuum. We don't. Um, but we do have one law. <laughs> it's called the law of demand. I mean, technically it's the law of compensated demand. I won't bore you with the, the difference here, but uh, really what it says is, is Price goes up, demand goes down. Like, there's only two exceptions we've ever discovered that actually are, in fact, exceptions. And those two exceptions um, are not CO2. For CO2, it's the same as for most every commodity out there. You increase the price and demand goes down. Mm -hmm. So right, we have too much CO2. We need to price it. Full mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. You also mentioned the challenge that uh, former Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan had when mm -hmm. he stopped fuel subsidies in in 2012. What what uh, happened? His, what happened there? And is it you know? Well, uh, his good luck ran out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, there were suddenly riots on the streets uh, when he, in fact, decreased. Uh, subsidies on petrol. Now, of course, if your population is used to having just those subsidies and the price of gasoline goes up right, overnight in that case, which of course was not the most politically astute move, uh, you will have protests, right? Um, same happens in Iran, same happens, so what happened in Saudi Arabia, right? Um, of course. Um, now, that doesn't make it the right thing to do, right? It's still a step backwards to be subsidizing fossil fuels. Or, or at least in the, in the wrong direction, because we should be paying for the damage we inflict on others and not getting paid to inflict it. But, but you're not against subsidies in principle. Well, there's also sort of economics 102, let's say. Uh, much like there is a negative uh, spillover effect of CO2 on everybody else, right? So you or I board a plane, uh, 7 billion people fit pay for the cost 
But then there's also flip sides. There is there are positive externalities. There are learning by doing externalities. This is sort of economics 102, right? It's uh, it's not sort of the most obvious thing to say, uh, but it turns out when you sit in your garage and you tinker uh, with the next great invention, you don't consider the fact that you are creating shoulders for others to stand on, right? You basically you only consider the benefits that accrue to you personally. You don't consider the positive externalities, and there are positive externalities of new inventions, right? There's a new technology out there, and renewables in many ways, sadly, um, are still very much new technologies at this point. Uh, they deserve a subsidy. But then there's also the Solyndra argument about the solar company that got massive subsidies and went bust because it couldn't compete with the new solar technologies. There's a school of thought that says subsidies of any kind distort the market and prevent it from working its magic. Um, any truth to that? Well, sort of, right? And every time you mention Solyndra, I would mention Tesla. Right? <laughs> so uh, turns out, or SpaceX for that matter, this is actually, this story just came out, which is actually pretty fascinating. NASA essentially saved SpaceX from uh, certain demise. Uh, and uh, same with a Department of Energy loan that went to uh, Tesla, which Tesla, of course, has repaid by now. Uh, but uh, there too, right? So yes, picking winners is hard, turns out. And arguably, right, venture capitalists are better at that than the U.S. government. No surprise there. So Lindra demonstrated there is a lot of learning to be done when it comes to um, looking at these very new technologies uh, that are, in fact, long shots often, right? If it, were, if it were a sure bet, right, there would be no need for, for subsidies. There would be plenty of money um, supporting that particular technology already. Well, sometimes... It is, in fact, a long shot. And by the way, what, what, what Solyndra really showed, actually, was how fantastically cheap solar photovoltaic technology has gotten very, very quickly. You go into a lot of detail on how we can uh, quantify uncertainties and probabilities and how you believe these should influence the actual price on carbon. And we'll, we'll, um, we'll get into those details later. Uh, but I'd like to focus now on your doomsday scenario. You make a very strong case for there being a 10% probability that we'll see a 6 degrees Celsius increase, or about 11 degrees Fahrenheit, if we don't change soon. But that means we also have a 90% probability that we won't go higher than that. So why should we all be paying a price on carbon now? We take out homeowner's insurance or fire insurance or life insurance for probabilities much, much lower than 10%. There's some fairly um, involved, uh, um, complex scientific um, ventures out there, including one sponsored by the European Union, European Commission. It's called Helix. It's basically climate scientists coming together, trying to estimate what will happen uh, degree by degree of warming. And, you know, like one degree is pretty easy, mainly because we're already there, right? So we can already estimate the consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, 1.5 degrees, um, can wrap our heads around and figure out what, what should happen, what will happen. Uh, then two degrees is already a lot harder, but at least it's, you know, most of it is, in fact, quantifiable. Like, you know, two and a half, three degrees is already a lot harder. And frankly, that project, too, basically ends at six degrees, uh, and simply it's just, you know, they throw their hands in the air and say, look, like, catastrophe is catastrophe. There's not much more you can add. Um, so we just, we, we just, A, don't know enough, frankly, and it's going to be so bad anyways, right? At four or five degrees already, what point is there looking at? at, at six degrees. And we are, meanwhile, looking at at least a 10% probability of hitting that amount of global average warming, right? And that's, yeah. that's again, that's the shock in climate shock. And you also go into a lot of detail on the history of climate science and how we've known about this for over a century. And I won't go into that here, but I would like to get into the history of the economic thought behind all this and specifically focus on a man named Arthur Pigou. Uh, I've never read his stuff directly, but I've seen him cited and paraphrased all over the place. And I wanted to read your paraphrase here because it, it does get to the core of why you say we need a price on carbon. 
Uh, first, you point out that the average American emits about 20 tons of CO2 per year. You argue for a price of about $40 a ton. And again, we'll get to the reasoning for that price later, but it translates into either $800 per person per year or 35 cents per gallon at the filling station on average. Here's your summary of what Pigou says. You say, quote, Pigou's crucial insight was that we ought to see and pay these costs right then and there at the pump. That's the only way to create the right incentives and lead us to incorporate the full cost into our daily decisions and stop privatizing benefits while socializing costs. Can you tell us a little bit about Pigou and then explain why he argues it's so important to charge at the point of sale? Yep. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, uh, Pigou did not, in fact, talk about CO2. Right, right. He, he spoke about it. rabbits overrunning a meadow, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and, and this is actually, this is the fascinating thing, right? The, the, the person, the, the economist coming up with a solution for what to do about climate change is never going to win a Nobel Prize for um, in economics because he died a decade before the first prize was given out, right? I mean, this is uh, much like climate science itself. It's sort of 19th century stuff. Uh, even the solution has been known for over 100 years. And yes, it is in fact making sure that everybody pays for the full cost that his or her actions, in this case, when it comes to climate change, global warming, are causing, right? So, and I mean, it's, it's sort of one of these sort of such obvious concepts. I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a Wikipedia page dedicated uh, uh, to privatizing benefits, socializing costs. Now, that's frankly what led to the Great Recession last decade, right? Not too long ago. And that's exactly what's going on here, right? So on a planetary scale, we are privatizing benefits, we are socializing the costs. I get the benefit of flying. Seven billion people people are paying for the cost. That is crazy. Now, of course, you know, one can in fact voluntarily say, okay, well, you know, let me let me spend the twenty, forty dollars to offset my personal carbon emissions voluntarily. Of course, that's possible, right? Now that's not the point, right? We can't rely on the you know ten thousand environmentalists who would voluntarily offset their emissions. It has to be the billion people every year who board flights to not voluntarily get the chance to do that, uh, but to actually be compelled to do it. And of course, that requires policy, right? And the Pigouvian insight is in fact that that only makes a difference when it happens right then and there when you make that decision. But will that actually reduce emissions or are people going to just pay and keep flying? Like, you know, what is then the solution, if not a price? Well, you know, a ban, right, may well be the solution. Now, that's literally saying there is an infinite cost of you boarding a flight, which is clearly not the right answer, right? I mean, the, the, first of all, yeah, there must be sort of life and death situations when it's actually fine to board the plane, right? Let's start with that. Um, and then more importantly, well, they're not in fact infinite costs. Now, they're you know, probably much higher costs than the $40 per ton. That's clear too, right? The, the right number may well be a lot higher if you take all these sort of unknown unknowns and all these uncertainties uh, seriously, uh, then the right price may well be higher than 40 bucks. Right? I don't know whether it's 400 or 4,000, but you know, it's certainly higher than, four, than 40 bucks. Now, um, banning flights is clearly not the right answer. Actually, so possibly a simpler example, right? Plastic bags, right? Like, mm -hmm. We know they have a cost, right? We know that every single plastic bag, right, like is useful up to a point, uh, which is, of course, part of the point, in fact. Uh, but of course, there are, in fact, costs to producing the plastic bag that are included in the price and, frankly, to disposing and most more often than not improperly disposing the plastic bag, right? I mean, ask the seagull, right, caught in one, what, what, what he or she thinks <laughs> about, about the plastic bag. Um, now, what's the cost of the plastic bag? Well, again, probably not infinitely much, right? Now, should we have back taxes? Should we have fees? Every time you walk into a store and basically just uh, mindlessly, uh, don't think about it, just get the plastic bag, of course we should, right? And it turns out these things work beautifully. So, you know, Ireland uh, uh, was among the first that introduced this plastax, 
um, 15 euro cents initially. Well, and back demand went down by something like 80 percent. But price isn't the only thing that changes people's behavior. And you talk about the Copenhagen theory of change, which is more about doing the right thing for its own sake. Well, the basically sort of two broad and very much competing theories in how to evoke social change. So one is um, what we sort of somewhat glibly call the Copenhagen theory of change. So question is, right, so a sort of simple observation, there's you know, over half of residents in Copenhagen bike to work. Now, why in the world is that the case, right? So first of all, it's pretty darn cold up there in the winter, right? So it's not like Copenhagen is such a pleasant place to work in the dead of winter. So why do so many people bike to work? Well, it turns out it is one of these things that takes, that has taken decades um, to develop, but frankly, it's sort of this virtuous cycle, you know, virtuous cyclists, if you will, but certainly virtuous cycle, right, of basically, you know, as initially there were a few individual bikers, as there always are, right, the guys in the spandex suits, and right, eventually it became you know, sort of easier and cheaper in sort of all senses of the term to start biking, so more people started biking, and then the first bike paths came came in and being and well that that meant you didn't have to take out as extra life insurance just to sort of be able to bike to work uh right? and eventually there were more bike paths and more and more people started biking and sort of this virtuous cycle where individual steps lead to you know, small social steps that again leads to more individual steps and so on and you know, in many ways we, we see that in new york city now actually when it comes to biking right mayor bloomberg put in something like 500 miles of bike paths in New York City. I mean, you can go up and down Fifth Avenue a couple of times to get to 500 miles. Um, and you know, pretty amazing change. And yes, we see many, many more people biking in New York City now because it turns out you can actually bike now without getting killed. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, it's one thing leading to the next. Um, and that's sort of the hopeful story of how you get from you know, individual action individual steps taken very often by environmentalists um, in sort of the name of public good, uh, leading to public policy changes, which then lead to ever more individual changes. And you get this virtuous cycle um, that could right, sort of potentially in sort of, let's say, extreme form lead from, let's say, right, a bunch of people recycling, right, sort of environmentalists on the, on the one end, and on the other say, a price on CO2, right? the, the kind of policy that we know is necessary. Now, here's the opposing theory to this, and frankly, one that economists are inherently more comfortable with. So it turns out day has only 24 hours, right? There are trade-offs. There are finite numbers of, of dollars going around, right? So everyone's budget is, in fact, constrained in one way, shape, or form, what economists call budget constraints, they are real, right? We don't have infinite sums to spend on everything we like. We need to make decisions. We need to take um, individual steps sometimes that lead in one direction and not in the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, frankly, leads to sort of this very real, uh, I would say, fear in a sense. I mean, sort of a personal fear of mine that, frankly, individual steps of you know doing good won't actually lead to more, but in fact are akin to a step backwards to what is actually necessary. Mm-hmm. Right. So you know again, twenty four hours in a day. Right. So you know I, you know, for example, right, my wife is a gynecologist. She works on um, few women dying in childbirth. Right. An enormously difficult issue. Um, and she works on family planning issues. Right. As a very, very important issues. Now, you know, what I spend maybe what three minutes a week thinking mm-hmm. about that particular problem. Now, see, you know, she's a better human being, so she spends four minutes mm-hmm. a week thinking about what I do for a living. Um, but you know, that's about it, right? We all have lives, or you know, at least mm-hmm. we have kids, right? So, uh, so mm-hmm. uh, there are constraints. That's this sort of the single action bias, a crowding right, out right. bias. That one thing doesn't, in fact, lead to the next, but that one thing sort of sometimes is the last thing or the only thing you do, right? And you basically, you refuse the plastic bag at the checkout counter 
um, and you, you know, we basically declare global warming solved for the day, and you go on about your life and not worry about everything else, right? Or anything else, and that's that's a real problem. And frankly, you know, I don't know which of these two theories will prevail. In fact, both of them are valid, are very valid in certain situations. And the big, big question is, right, under which circumstances is which theory, which of these two theories going to apply? That's mm -hmm. question one. And of course, I mean, the second question, I mean, how do you get from uh, potential for this crowding out bias uh, toward this Copenhagen theory of change, where basically do you have these, these virtuous cycles? How does the political economy work out to get from where we are today to where we need to be? And what do we need to do uh, to make that happen? There's a famous experiment they did in Israel where kindergartens or it might have been preschools, I forget which, um, they started charging parents who were late to pick up their kids. And it backfired because parents just started coming late and they figured, hey, I'm paying for it. No guilt. Uh, so, so this is some, sort of, yes, this is sort of this infamous study, right, of basically sort of behavioral psychologists or behavioral economists even, uh, sort of studying what happens once you start introducing fees, right? And sort of the story goes that, well, there was this social norm that you pick up your kid at, you know, say 5 p.m. in the afternoon or in, in the evening. Um, and well, they observed that sometimes parents were late and that was a pain. So they started charging, right, for every minute that the parent was late, let's say like a buck a minute, let's say. What, what did they observe? Well, they observed that that social norm suddenly broke down. It was no longer the case that most people picked up their kid at five o'clock. And, you know, on occasion, sometimes somebody was late. Um, but what happened now was that lots of people started being late. It just charged or they just paid the dollar right when i look at this i am sort of of, of two minds here so so yes of course right that social norm just broke down first of all really what that means you're not charging enough right a second thing to say frankly is so what i mean frankly okay so i have a five-year-old and a two and a half year old um i i appreciate flexibility when it comes to child care right i would like to pay for the privilege to sometimes be flexible as in other words on occasion right i i'm not able to leave when i thought i was able to and i would appreciate the extra 5 10 15 minutes um of finishing up that right one paragraph or one email or you know one tweet or whatever the case may be um pick up my kids slightly late and frankly of course right there are costs of that behavior so i should be paying the child care provider for that. So in other words, really what this particular study observed uh, was that parents appreciate flexibility. They are willing to pay for it if the costs to the daycare of keeping the kid one minute longer are in fact not covered by the fee that they're charging. Well, then they're doing it wrong, right? They should charge a higher fee. Mm -hmm. But if, if that's the case, right? Once that's the case, um, and you create the possibility for parents to be more flexible, show up a minute later and pay a buck a minute or whatever it was um, to show up a minute late. Fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. Social welfare, social well-being just increased because you're creating that added flexibility. In other words, right? Econ 101, once again, right? Yeah. Turns out price goes up, demand goes down. That works, right? If you increase the price to infinity, right? If you ban pick up if you ban late pickups uh you're not even creating the option then yes people turn tend to be on time um and if you start charging for pickups that's in fact a lower price than infinitely much well sometimes people appreciate the flexibility to me this is also a reminder that we need to make a distinction between creating an incentive which sounds like a cold calculation and creating awareness or a focus, like the plastic bag fee does. Um, and this is actually uh, something we found at Ecosystem Marketplace when looking at corporate behavior in the voluntary markets, the voluntary carbon markets. We looked at companies that buy carbon offsets voluntarily, meaning not because they have to, and we found that, contrary to popular belief, they weren't quote unquote buying their way out of their obligations or using a get out of a get out of jail free card but they were for the most part companies that had already reduced their emissions dramatically and they were using offsets exactly the way they're supposed to 
namely to get to zero net emissions or to create an internal price on carbon explicitly to make their divisions and managers and everybody along the line more consciously aware of the emissions. Absolutely, right? I mean, <laughs> I would sort of call this sort of the frying pan effect, right? Like you whack someone over the head mm -hmm. and they become aware of it. Uh, the decision to sort of start thinking about what it takes to internalize the cost of CO2 is in fact a sea level decision, right? This is not something sort of the lowly plant manager says, oh, well, let's just make that happen. It is, of course, a much broader uh, decision with, with much broader reverberations right, throughout the company. Then it's the, there's the question of how do you send the right signal throughout every level of the company? And frankly, pricing works beautifully in that way. You know, Microsoft is a good example of a place yeah. that has an internal cap and trade system. And yes, they are offsetting their remaining emissions, not because they have to, they don't but because they're trying to be good corporate citizens and are basically saying, look, we're trying to minimize our CO2 uh, footprint as it is. And what we can't minimize, what we can't, in fact, eliminate, we are offsetting by spending right, the tens of millions of dollars that it takes to buy voluntary offsets in order to offset our emissions completely and essentially you know, be carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. But then there's also, well, A, the question, what price are the companies paying? That's, mm -hmm. that's a big one, right? And it turns out Microsoft, in fact, is buying renewable energy credits, which turn out to be very, very cheap per right. ton of CO2, sort of a buck or two. Frankly, it's still $2 more than most others are paying. So, you know, that's good too, right? Their internal price was a lot higher. Which is, of course, right? which is of course good too, right? Now, mm -hmm. all that said, right? Big question, right? Even someone as big as Microsoft or right? even someone as big as Walmart, let's say, or Apple or whoever it is, right? They themselves are not going to solve climate change either, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you and I can't, can't solve it with our individual actions. Well, Microsoft and Walmart can't either. Now, they are now more ready than their competitors to be facing an environment where carbon is in fact priced nationwide. If Microsoft taking these voluntary steps makes them more likely to be advocating for a national global price on CO2. Fantastic. Quick question. Do you like what you hear? Would you like to hear more? If so, can I ask you to share Bionic Planet with friends and give me a good, honest review on whichever podcatcher you use? And if you want Wagner's book, can you order it by clicking through to Amazon via my site, bionic-planet.com. That way, I'll get a few pennies, too. The audiobook is also excellent, by the way, and you can get it as part of a free 30-day trial to audible.com and support me at the same time by going to audibletrial.com forward slash bionicplanet. That's bionicplanet as a single word with no dots, dashes, or spaces. The address again, audibletrial, all one word, audibletrial.com forward slash bionicplanet. Finally, and probably best of all, from my perspective, you can support me directly by becoming a member of Bionic Planet for as little as $1 per month at bionic-planet.com or at patreon.com forward slash bionicplanet. Once again, that's bionic-planet.com or patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash bionicplanet with no dots or dashes. I've set the patronage page up so that you can support me per episode, but with a monthly cap. So if you think $5 per month is good for a five-episode month, you can pledge $1 per episode, but with a $5 monthly cap. That way, if I don't manage to generate five episodes in a month, you're not paying for something you didn't get. And if I go nuts and deliver 20 episodes one month, you won't get whacked either. By the same token, you can offer $5 per episode, or 10 or 50 or whatever. I won't complain. As I mentioned in there, my full-time gig is at a place called Ecosystem Marketplace, which is a news service and research group set up by the environmental NGO Forest Trends. One thing that Ecosystem Marketplace is known for are our annual surveys of carbon markets. And we focus on forest carbon and finance and on voluntary carbon markets. We usually find a price per ton far below what Wagner advocates, usually around $5 per ton. 
The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, recently conducted a survey of compliance markets, meaning markets where companies that don't reduce their emissions are legally obligated to buy offsets. These offsets are traded through formal emissions trading schemes, or ETSs. You'll hear that word in a second, ETSs. And in theory, the prices should be higher because companies are obligated to buy them. But the OECD found that even these prices are low, about $8 per ton. Which brings up a question. Is it more effective to issue a limited number of offsets and let the market find the price through a system called cap-and-trade? Or is it better to set a price from the start, essentially a carbon tax? Angel Gurria is the Secretary General of the OECD. Here he is at the Paris Climate Talks. Practically all the other ETSs that we know of, including the seven pilots in China, and four times, four times that we have attempted to take a price uh, to take off in Europe, we have not been able to make it. Whereas the countries that went for the tax did it very efficiently. And I have to say here, the British Columbia example in uh, Canada itself works like a charm. Why? Because it started low, and then they planned it over time. People know when it's coming. They haven't lost any competitiveness. They just know it's going to be increasing over time. Now it is, and it has modified conduct. So far, in other words, cap and trade programs outnumber carbon tax programs. But the carbon taxes are, he says, delivering better results, in part because the price is predictable, which we'll see in the second half of our show is not the case with cap and trade. But that's by design. Now, Gurria points out that a carbon tax works best when it's introduced gradually. But that, of course, is how caps are usually implemented. They start high and come down over time. With me so far? Good. He continues. The people in British Columbia not only respond to price stimulus, but they also are proud of the fact that they have the mechanism. And therefore, they act with this pride of saying, we are you know, doing better. Uh, and because it's a, it's a regional, provincial mechanism, they kind of you know, say we can do better than the next, than the next province uh, up or down. So people will support a carbon tax, or presumably a carbon market as well, if they understand why it exists. And like U.S. citizens did in their country's race to the moon back in the 1960s, they'll even embrace it, as the Swedes have too. Sweden has 100 euros per avoided ton of CO2 equivalent today. Uh, of course, They started uh, way below, and then they started jacking it up. And again, it works. It does not seem to affect the competitiveness. So I would say that we already know that generally uh, taxes seem to work uh, better than the ETS systems. So why do so many of us love cap and trade? Politically, people don't like to talk about taxes. But it sounds a little trivial as a reason because effectively if it works better and we know it works better and we know it bites and it changes conduct, then perhaps it should be uh, the choice. Now, I'd argue there's more to cap-and-trade than just political expediency. To me, cap-and-trade has the added element of flexibility. Namely, the price will adjust based on emission reductions achieved. So if we fail to reduce enough, the price will automatically go up, increasing pressure to reduce. While, at the same time, trading pushes money to the most efficient emission reduction strategies and technologies. But, as Gurio points out, one man's flexibility is another man's price risk. And unlike climate change itself, this isn't really a settled science. Still, I think anyone would be hard-pressed to argue with Gurria's final words. Now, the political hurdles to carbon pricing can become opportunities if the funds are redirected to advance more inclusive social and economic agendas. Very good examples of Reduction in subsidies and applying it to the poorest and also the taxes, applying it precisely to solve the problem of climate change. So let me finish by saying, dear friends, let's design, develop, and deliver together and fast better climate policies, including a big fat price on carbon for better lives. Thank you. <laughs> 
Picking up on that, I asked Wagner if he'd be willing to weigh in on the differences between a carbon tax and cap and trade. I'd be happy to get into this, but in some sense, cap versus tax is a very academic debate that sort of floats economists' boats that actually has little bearing on the real world other than sort of for the tactical food fights, which frankly are sort of, you know, important, but in some sense are also meaningless because, you know, for crying out loud, we're all trying to do the same thing here. And yes, there are certain differences between the two instruments that matter, but either of the two is so much better than the status quo that the differences actually don't really matter all that much. The operative question in all of this is, what is the, what is the actual price, right? Now, in the long run, that doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter in the sense that the point in the long run is to get emissions down to zero or below zero for that matter. Well, if we can do that at low cost, that's a success, right? So we shouldn't judge an emissions trading system itself by its price, assuming the cap is strong enough um, to accomplish what needs to get done. Now, of course, right, the, the shadow price, the price of the allowance is in fact a proxy of the strength of the system. That is true too, of course. Um, and the big question then is, well, how do you evaluate where we are and where we need to go? And I mean, sadly, of course, the verdict really is that we need to go a lot further than where we are today. That's not a secret, right? There's Basically, there's no place anywhere with the sole exception of Sweden and there too only certain sectors within Sweden, certain sectors within the Swedish economy that have a sufficiently high carbon tax where it may be appropriate to debate whether the tax is the right value. Anywhere else on the planet, including in the Swedish sectors not covered by the carbon tax, and there are many, the question is not what should the right price be. The question is how can we increase the price from where it currently is because it is much, much, much too low. Mm -hmm. You spent a lot of time in the book explaining the way that a social price on carbon is calculated. You started with uh, the DICE model. Um, DICE stands for dynamic integration dyna dynamic integrated climate economy and then you explained three other models can you maybe just give us the basics of how we calculate the social cost of carbon well actually so the social cost of carbon is in many ways a sort of a misnomer beginning with the word carbon uh, it actually measures the social cost of one ton of co2 not c and there's a difference um now, what it does do is essentially quantify what we know are the damages associated with one ton of CO2 emissions emitted into the atmosphere today. Now, that ton stayed up there for a while, for right, centuries, millennia, um, on average, and it does a lot of damage. Now, one can quantify that damage. Of course, the big, big problem is that like, this is where the conservative part comes in. We can quantify the known knowns or, you know, some of them. We can't quantify the known unknowns. And, of course, we have no idea by definition what the unknown unknowns are, other than essentially trying to point to which direction they would go in, right? Um, do the known unknowns point to a higher number than we currently calculate um, or a lower number? And sadly most signs indicate that most of these known unknowns point in the direction that the current estimate, the $40 per ton of CO2, is a woeful underestimate of the true cost of, of that ton, the true cost of climate change. So in other words, the social cost of carbon we currently use, the $40, that's the U.S. government figure, um, can only be a lower bound of what we ought to use to incorporate the cost of climate change. In the book, you made a very strong case for it being a lot higher. What's your what's your own ideal price? Actually, in 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 the book, in Climate Shock, we actually very deliberately declined to give a figure at all. What we do in many ways is to point to how uncertainty um, itself is costly, how not knowing is costly, and how frankly 
almost everything points to the fact that the $40 that is calculated based on the known knowns, based on what we know, can only be a, do- a lower bound because, frankly, everything we don't know, most everything we don't know, points to a higher price. Can you give us a, a concrete example of a, a, a known unknown? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's sort of as, a, as an instructive example on this, on the known unknowns part. Um, the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, the one that came out in uh, 2007, um, included um, an estimate of sea level rise, global average sea level rise, in, so I did six executive summary. Um, and that was based on two things. Uh, thermal expansion, as in warmer water takes up more space, and we can calculate that fairly well or fairly accurately because we know how much water there is in the oceans. We know how much the warming is. Of course, lots of uncertainty around that too. But if you, know, if you assume a certain degree of uh, warming, you can estimate thermal expansion, the effect of thermal expansion on sea level rise. Now, turns out the water also rises because ice melts. That's, of course, not a secret. Now, ice melts in two parts, sort of inland glaciers as well as the poles, right? polar ice caps. Now, in many ways, of course, polar ice caps is what ought to concern us more because there's a lot of more ice. There's a lot of more potential sea level rise. Uh, but it turns out in 2007, the uncertainty around... Um, global average sea level rise by the end of the century, for example, based on the melting of ice caps, was so large that the scientists, part of this report, declined to provide an average figure. Right? They gave us a range. Uh, they gave us pages and pages of estimates of what is going to happen. But the summary statistic, the summary figure, did not in fact include the fact that polar ice caps melt. Now, that's a known unknown, right? Of course, it ended up in a footnote. It's not a secret that ice melts. Um, But the estimate we had after 2007 didn't, in fact, include that fact. Now, 2013, fifth assessment report was different. Um, Scientists, in that case, did agree to include an average estimate of what will happen when polar ice caps melt um, into the summary statistic. And lo and behold, that estimate went up. Of course it does. <laughs> um, so that number basically turned from a, a known unknown to a known known. Now there's a ra- there's an uncertainty range around it, right? We don't know for sure. We, we can't. Uh, but of course we know that, that it is in fact an increase, right? That the contribution of melting polar ice caps is in fact positive to global sea level rise. Positive in the sense that it in the sense that it raises sea levels, so it, it's a negative consequence of climate change. Um, but that's a good example of a statistic, a quantity that frankly well, was a known quantity or a known process, but turned in within five years from a known unknown into a known known in the sense that the summary statistic now includes the actual estimate. And, and frankly, that's big news, right? That's sort of big scientific news in the sense that we are not confident enough to add the estimate of the melting of polar ice caps and their effect on global average sea level rise to this summary statistic. Um, That's good news in a scientific sense. Of course, it's bad news in the sense when you look at the result because now our estimates, of course, increase by quite a bit. And, of course, the uh, deniers then use that adjustment to try and discredit the science. Um, Can you walk us through the process of turning this uncertainty into a price on carbon? Um, sure. So, I mean, what, what happens in, in, a, in a rough sense is that right, you have the physical event, let's say sea level rise. Now, of course, what we really care about as a society is the economic damages associated with that event, right? The, like, how does it hurt you personally? Um, the link there is what's called a damage function, as in for every degree of warming or every meter of sea level rise or foot of sea level rise, what are the economic damages associated with that? 
So in a in theory, what you would have is a damage function with every one of these potential events. And then you look at all these damages, you add them up, you discount them back to the present, and you can link them to the additional ton of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere today, right? Every one of these tons causes some damage, um, and that damage associated with that ton is, in fact, its optimal social price, right? So um, you're not going to ban that ton of CO2 emissions. What we're trying to do is price the full cost, right? So every time you board an airplane, fly across the Atlantic, one ton of CO2 emissions, well, what's the social cost associated with that one ton of CO2 that is not included, not currently included, uh, in the price you pay for your ticket, um, <laughs> this is so complicated. And it was a real epiphany for me when you compared the amount of computing power devoted to programs like DICE to marketing research that Procter & Gamble do because they use massive amounts of data and computing power while DICE uh, can run on a PC. I mean, that that to me says a lot about our priorities, right? In, in, in some sense. Now, I mean, of course, this is you know, sort of a an imperfect analogy, if you will. I, I actually don't know for a fact how many PhD statisticians are used in order to determine the price of a right, toothpaste. Uh, but of course, actually, it turns out there are massive data that go into these kinds of calculations. Now, when it comes to calculating the social cost of carbon, um, so the models used for that, they are typically, or they have been typically built by basically one economist and, you know, a grad student or two working with that economist. Um, and there are three models that are being used to calculate the U.S. social cost of carbon. Now, it doesn't mean that those models aren't in themselves good representations of what we think ought to be calculated. But frankly, by now, most everyone, including those who built the models themselves, agree that they need to be overhauled. Um, and frankly, it's not just a matter of computing power, right? It's not just a matter of saying, oh, if we throw more resources at the problem, um, we can do a better job. We could, of course we could. Uh, but it's also a matter of essentially, in some sense, changing the structure of the models themselves. So this is where the uh, this kind of around financial economics comes in, right? By now, we know more about how to price assets, including assets with negative returns, like CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, we should use those lessons. We should use those lessons in trying to build uh, these integrated assessment models in a way that reflects both the latest in theoretical economics and also um, much more empirical knowledge around climate damages. What I found fascinating is how science and uh, temperature and price, it all fits together. And it really helped me to see how the understanding of uh, climate sensitivity, which is how such and such an increase in CO2 will result in such and such an increase in temperatures. It helped me to see how that understanding evolved. And I was wondering if you could give us a step-by-step -step explanation of how climate sensitivity evolved and how that evolution feeds into the pricing model. Sure. So, I mean, in fact, there's several steps here. Right? So uh, it begins with how much do we emit, but how much CO2 goes into the atmosphere. Now, it turns out it's not the CO2 that we emit year after year. It's the CO2 that's in the atmosphere that's most closely associated with um, climate change, with average warming. Um, so in other words, it's this initial step is from emissions to concentrations. Then there's a link from concentrations to temperatures. And that's where climate sensitivity comes in. So climate sensitivity is this parameter that tells us what happens to global average temperatures eventually. Every one of these words matters, global average eventually, uh, as concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere double. Um, so that's the link between concentrations and temperatures. Then there's one between temperatures and economic damages. That's the damage function. Um, and just that step alone, the, the, the link between uh, concentrations and temperatures, climate sensitivity, is in fact something that's been the vexing climate scientist for quite a while. As in, uh, it, there's a range, there's an uncertainty range, there is what's called a likely range of where climate sensitivity is. And 
ever since we first started looking at this seriously in the late 70s, 1979, the first National Academy study, um, we've had quite a range, quite an uncertainty range uh, around this parameter. Um, now, unfortunately, right, uncertainty is not our friend here. In other words, not knowing the specific estimate is in fact costly in and of itself, mainly, of course, because if we knew for sure where things were going, we could adapt. We could we knew what to do. Like obviously, we would want to avoid climate change in the first place. Uh, but if we knew specifically where things were going, how many feet sea levels are going to rise by when, we could adapt. It would still be costly, but at least we could adapt more easily. The fact that we don't know, and especially the fact that we can't exclude extreme values of this range. Uh, of this co of, of this link between concentrations and temperatures in itself is extremely costly. The not knowing is what increases, ought to increase, our uh, social cost of carbon, the price of emitting one additional ton of CO2 by quite a bit. You also touched on something that I think we all wrestle with, which is how to position ourselves for this new reality. And you talked about two different investment portfolios, one for the world, one for a world in which we get this thing under control and one for a world in which we don't. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit. I mean, in, in some sense, I mean, this is sort of a thought experiment, right? So um, when you look at how many parts per million of CO2 there's in the atmosphere, well, we are currently, we've passed 400 ppm, 400 parts per million. Um, we started at 280 pre-industrial times, and of course, I, uh, well, there are, there are political moves to try to limit CO2. Fortunately, there are right CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, there's something called 350.org, right, which is probably among the nerdiest organizations you could imagine. It's named after a PPM goal of how much CO2 there ought to be in the atmosphere, right? So 350.org says we should not exceed 350 ppm and that's probably that's probably pretty reasonable goal now eventually of course we want to go back to 280 but we certainly don't want to be where we are heading right right now we're at 400 and frankly we are on the way up right co2 in the atmosphere is increasing year after year after year um now here's a thought experiment well imagine a world where we are in fact at 350 parts per million three the 350 ppm scenario. Um, and on the flip side, imagine a world where you're, where you're at 700 parts per million. Now, it turns out, unfortunately, getting to 700 ppm is a lot easier than getting to 350. 700 so just means we should you know, keep going the way we're going right now. 350 means massive political action, massive, techno massive technological change, massive interventions to get to 350, whereas 700 is basically where we're heading. Now, 700, of course, is associated with a lot of negative effects of climate change, what would call catastrophic effects of climate change, and probably many, depending on your definition of economic catastrophe, many of these effects, in fact, are catastrophic. Um, meanwhile, 350 parts per million, of course, would have seen much less climate change, still plenty of, of nasty effects baked in there as well. But overall, it's clearly a much better future. Now, Imagine a 350 ppm scenario, imagine a 700 ppm scenario, and now imagine, right, given I'm an economist, right, sort of look at it from an economic perspective. So imagine you have a billion dollars to invest in each of these worlds. How would you think about your investment? Now, in a simple sense, of course, well, it turns out in a, if you think the 700 ppm world is more likely, well, you have to insure yourself against the worst consequences of climate change. Uh, you buy right, fresh water in Canada. You buy sort of assets that are, in fact, associated with safe bets, in, even in a world that is experiencing massive global warming. Uh, meanwhile, 350 parts per million is, well, that's sort of the happy world. And frankly, in order to get there, well, you need to invest in wind and solar and uh, low-carbon technologies. Um, and you will have very different, you'll make very different investment decisions. If you think we're heading towards 350 ppm, uh, then if we are heading towards 700 parts per million. 
I took it as more than just a, a thought experiment. To me, it's a, a core question. Should I have my retirement money and renewables and other technologies that will help us avoid the worst, or should it all be in life rafts and greenhouses and property in the woods and maybe the defense sector? <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, frankly, in, in many ways, it ought to be both. Now, I, I mean, this, this is not a lost cause, not at all, right? We clearly have to invest in the kinds of technologies that, will, that are currently already available and in many ways have to be deployed at scale, or for that matter, the kinds of sort of breakthrough technologies, right? This Bill Gates' Breakthrough Energy Initiative, uh, with a very clear aim of investing in technologies that are not currently available, um, that are sort of these, these high-risk bets, but bets nonetheless that could potentially do a lot of good. Well, this is, of course, where sort of venture capital-style investment comes in. So there is plenty to do on the clean, lean, uh, green tech front in order to do something about climate change in the first place. Uh, that said, of course, well, there is already plenty of climate risk baked in in where we are. So, yes, it is a bit of both. Now, you know, both, both speaking as someone who's hoping to avert the worst, you know, you, you might call it as an activist, and uh, sort of as a rational response to where we are, I would say it is that the balance clearly ought to be on a lot more investment on the technology front in order to avoid climate change in the first place. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't really be investing in geoengineering, or at least we shouldn't be betting on it, right? Well, <laughs> that's an that's a interesting question now. Uh, I guess the question is what you mean by betting on it. Now we shouldn't we shouldn't you know sit back and relax and essentially say, well, we don't have to decrease emissions at all. That's certainly not the case, right? Geoengineering is not the perfect solution to our problem. Um, like if you will, you can liken it to sort of chemotherapy for the planet, right? Now, uh, should you? start smoking just because an experimental drug works in a lab rat somewhere, right? An experimental cancer drug works in a lab rat. Should you take up smoking? No, of course not, right? Step one, stop smoking. Well, now, that said, if you walk into the doctor's office and you do, in fact, have cancer, well, that doctor would be remiss not to know what chemotherapy was. Now, the analogy, of course, isn't perfect, um, as no analogy ever is, uh, but when it comes to geoengineering, uh, and what when I say geoengineering, I mean solar geoengineering, so um, increasing the albedo of the planet in order to reflect more sunlight back into space and cooling the planet that way. Just to clarify, solar engineering is this um, squirting of chemicals up into the atmosphere to act as a shield that keeps out the solar radiation, the sun. It's kind of like volcanoes do when they erupt, um, but with more clear intent. Um, well, it turns out from a, uh, at a high level, we know that works. Volcanoes have been doing it forever, or for the matter, we know it works because we are wearing white between, la uh, between Memorial and Labor Day and, and our winter coats are black, right? So white reflects sunlight back and cools us off. Uh, black absorbs sunlight, um, makes us warmer. Uh, that what works for clothing also works for the planet. Um, and volcanoes have been um, spewing uh, sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere basically forever. And every time that happens, uh, global average temperatures decrease. So in principle, we know it works. As a matter of fact, in principle, like we also know that um, like by now we have plenty of climate model runs that essentially point to the fact that uh, there is a lot of potential here to do a lot of good. Um, in other words, yes, we should do the research to find out more about solar geoengineering in itself. Now, does that mean we can sit back and not do anything on the carbon pricing front? Of course not. Right? We have to price CO2. We have to limit CO2 emissions. We have to decrease CO2 emissions. You have to get CO2 emissions down below zero. Um, but um, 
we also do to, ought to do the research on the solar geoengineering front, frankly, to figure out whether there is a there there. Now, like in many ways, that the, the best science tells us that there is. Um, but of course, a lot more research has to happen in order to get to a place where we can confidently say uh, whether and how um, solar geoengineering could, in fact, help us decrease climate risk. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, but that's that's also a whole other can of worms, and I think I'll have to do that on a, on another show. I've got another program scheduled to address uh, that issue exclusively. We might um, have to just leave it there, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was Gernot Wagner, co-author of the book Climate Shock, The Economic Consequences of a Hotter Planet, from Princeton University Press. That about wraps up this edition of Bionic Planet. I hope you found it helpful, and maybe even entertaining. This whole debate about how to deal with climate change should be front and center. And if you think I'm helping to frame it right, then feel free to share this with friends and family, and be sure to subscribe yourself. And give us an honest review so that others can find us. Until next time, I'm your host, Steve Zwick. Thanks for listening.